Good afternoon. Oh, mic check. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you all doing? How are you all doing? Good, good, good. So good to see so many people. I'm so grateful to all of you for coming to our first What Matters to Me and Why of the uh, fall of the spring semester of 2017. Um, how many first time folks do we have here today? Great. Thank you for coming. Uh, please grab some lunch. There's some uh, seats up here. Don't be afraid. No one will call on you. It's not class. <laughs> Come on up front. Um, we have an extraordinary lineup this semester. Uh, of course, starting today with uh, Professor Jody Armour. We have Karen Hubner, who's the Director of Academic Programs at the uh, Harmon Institute for Polymathic Study here at USC. We have Paula Cannon, who's a professor at Keck, a specialist in HIV AIDS research and the president of the Academic Senate. And we have Chief John Thomas, who runs our, our Department of Public Safety. So we really invite you and hope to see you uh, at all of the upcoming What Matters to Me and Why events this semester. We serve a free lunch. Um, and if you miss it, uh, make sure you check us out online. We videotape all of them. They go on the university's YouTube channel. Before I um, introduce today's uh, very special guest speaker, uh, I just want to shamelessly plug a few upcoming events. Uh, this Friday at 8.30 a.m., the UNRU Institute is hosting an inauguration viewing party. That's going to be at Wallace Annenberg Hall. It's open to the entire university community. It will be followed by a panel discussion. So if you are looking for a place to watch the inauguration to talk about it, um, that's a good spot. Friday at 10 a.m. this Friday, we're doing uh, an introduction to Buddhism session that's being run by the Tibetan Buddhist Student Organization here on campus. That'll be at uh, the University Religious Center in the Fishbowl. Saturday at 1.30 p.m. Uh, in University Religious Center, room 108, we have a workshop on Sufi meditation and movement at 1.30 p.m. That's open for everyone. This will be the first in a series of workshops that we're doing. And for those of you who know about the Good Karma Cafe, uh, we do a vegetarian cafe. Uh, it's like a pop-up cafe Tuesday and Wednesdays uh, at the university uh, church from 12 to 2. Starting next week, we're going to add a Thursday as well. Uh, so Tuesday will be uh, uh, Indian cuisine. Uh, Wednesday will be uh, Italian. And um, Thursday will be Mexican. So we're really excited about that after seven years to go to a third day. Uh, it's all you can eat. Bring your Tiffins. Bring your Tupperware. They, they mean it when they say all you can eat. And I would be remiss if I didn't say th uh, something about uh, Martin Luther King Day this week. Um, I was raised in a family that idolized Martin Luther King because I come from a Gandhian family. My great-grandmother was very close with Kasturba Gandhi, who was Mahatma Gandhi's wife. So I was raised with my grandfather, and he used to regale me with stories about uh, growing up around Mahatma Gandhi. Um, and when we, when, I, when, you know, when we were growing up in the U.S., Many of us who are Indian and Indian American felt a great deal of pride in, this, uh, in Gandhi's role in inspiring Martin Luther King and in the civil rights movement. We looked at that movement as our own movement in some ways. Just like my grandfather got to hang out with, Mar uh, with uh, Gandhi, I too am lucky that I've been able to hang out with one of the great civil rights icons of our time. When I first got to USC, they told me my job here as Dean of Religious Life was to be the chief religious or spiritual leader of the university. But when I got here, I realized that job was already taken. And my job was to sit at the feet of the chief religious and spiritual leader at our university. He's, like I said, one of the great civil rights icons of our time. He's a treasure in the city of Los Angeles. This year will mark the 25th anniversary of the Los Angeles riots. I hope that will shine a, sh a spotlight on all the extraordinary work he did to bring peace and calm and reconciliation to our city. He's here today, and I want to acknowledge him. So please join me in welcoming to What Matters to Me and Why, the Reverend Dr. Cecil Chip Murray. Chip, thank you for being here. Thank you. As you all know, normally we have students who introduce the speakers. Um, with Jody, there's literally thousands of students who would love that job, but I am going to take uh, the privilege of being the moderator here and introduce them myself. I went to UCLA uh, for law school, so I don't know that much about the law, <laughs> but uh, I went there because I, um, because I wanted to study critical race studies, and uh, Kimberly Crenshaw was there and Devin Carbato. And in my study, I got to know really some of the giants in the field, uh, some of the most important thinkers. And I really put Jody at the top of that list. My first teaching job was in the Law and Society program at UC Santa Barbara. And uh, for my race in the law class, I assigned Jody's book, Negrophobia and Reasonable Racism. And so I admired him from afar for many years. You know, it's a crazy thing when you grow up and at some point you realize that your heroes become your colleagues. That's what happened with me when I came to USC and I first met Jody. 
I really got to work closely with Jody last year as we served together on the Provost Task Force for Inclusion, Equity, and um, Diversity. And uh, I'm really proud of all the things that we were able to accomplish last year, and it's continuing this year. As some of you may know, we're about to launch the Race and Equity Center at the Rossier School of Education. We brought Sean Harper from University of Pennsylvania. We will become the National Center for Thinking About Campus Climate with this new hire. All of this progress was possible because we had extraordinary student leaders and activists uh, who uh, brought their minds and their hearts to these issues. We had an incredible new provost who really thought deeply about solving the wicked problems of the world and how the university could be part of the solution. But we also had Jody, who's been, who's been um, really advocating for uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion for at least 10 years on our campus. I don't think any of this would have been possible without his long and hard work. Oftentimes that work is behind the scenes. And together we're really able to move the needle on these issues, which is not easy at a large and complex research university like ours. In the world that I live in, the world of religious life, we have a name, we have a word. We have a word for someone who speaks truth to power, for someone who really expands the outer limits of justice and equity, for someone who has courage and bravery in the face of uh, difficult circumstances. That word is prophetic. And even though Jody is a brilliant legal mind, in my mind, he is also an important prophetic voice uh, for all of us, and no more so than right now. So, um, Jody Armour is the Roy Crocker Professor of Law at USC, where he specializes in race issues and in legal decision making. He also teaches torts, criminal law, and criminal procedure. He's so busy, um, and I'm so grateful for his generosity of time and spirit in being with us here today. I think it's especially poignant and meaningful that we hear from Jody uh, this week, Inauguration Week. Um, so uh, before I actually ask him to come on the stage, I just want to say we'll do, do a Q&A after his talk. I'm going to run a microphone around, so just wait for the microphone so we can get you on the video. With all that being said, please join me in giving a warm Trojan welcome to What Matters to Me and Why to my friend and colleague, Professor Jody David Armour. <laughs> It's a real honor and pleasure to be able to address you today. Uh, Varun, when we're talking about what matters, we have to start with relationships and people. And Varun, you know, is uh, too modest sometimes in not taking credit for all of the spearheading that he's done of inclusion, equity, and diversity matters around campus. So I want to thank you very much, Varun, for all your efforts. and. You know, it's taken me even time to fully appreciate all the ways that you have an impact on the great things that are going on on campus. So thank you very much. Um, Varun said that it would be preferable not to start with some of my lofty theories about law and equity and social justice, but to start with a little of the personal. What matters to me and why? What got me into the law? I was introduced to the wonders of the law at, year, at age eight, when our door to our home lost contact with the hinges and the frame. The frame and the hinges separated, and the next thing I knew, there was a phalanx of cops in my home. I was eight years old, with my dad on the ground, prostrate with his hand shackled behind his back, and the next time I saw him upright and not in a position of supine acquiescence to police officers and other servants of the state, he was in Ohio State Penitentiary doing 22 to 55 for first time possession and sale of marijuana. This is how they treated black men in 1968 in Akron, Ohio, when they were too uppity, he was a six foot, eight inch, barrel chested black man, all right, in Ohio at the time, having the temerity to own property and speak more eloquent Queen's English than many of the city servants around him and other Lilliputians. He was a black Gulliver among those Lilliputians at the time. And then on, all t on top of all that, he had the unmitigated gall 
to cross that one social boundary, that's still an emotional boundary for a lot of Americans, as you saw in the last election, was a big one back then, which was don't cross the racial line when it comes to intimacy. You know, racism can be boiled down to two things, economic competition and don't go skinny dipping in our gene pool, says white folk. We can go dipping in yours, right? That's why you have so many light-skinned black folk. During slavery, there was a lot of rape of black women. But don't, 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 reverse the, don't reverse that. Don't get that twisted, right? That's a lot of the emotional barrier that a lot of people feel to integration. And he had the gall to walk down Main Street in Akron, Ohio in the 50s and 60s, arm in arm with a red-headed Irish Catholic woman, right, with his black self at a time when that kind of thing made a lot of folks around him unhinged, right? So he was looking at 22 to 55, possession and sale, marijuana, and the charges were trumped up. I won't get into all of that now. Everybody says that. Here's what he had to do. He wasn't going to blast out with any TNT, right? There wasn't going to be any files slipped to him in a, in a, in a baked cake. He had to reach up on the shelves of the warden's own law library and start pulling down law books and teaching himself criminal law, criminal procedure, constitutional law. He, when he ran out of the warden's books, he had Ohio State law students start bringing him in books and reporters, all right? Wrote his own writs of habeas corpus, represented himself pro se, wrote his own writs of habeas corpus up through the state system, kicked over to the federal, up through the federal system. And I was standing there with him as a 14-year-old when he was standing in front of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in Cincinnati, arguing before an en banc panel of judges, literally for his life, right? You know, his, his life stood or fell on how persuasive his arguments were going to be in those legal briefs. And at the end of the day, I teach his case now in my criminal law classroom. It's called Armour versus Salisbury, in which the court said, yes, the state unconstitutionally deprived you of your rights in the way they went at you, right? And so the reason I'm able to teach that course in my case, that, that rather case in my course now with delicious irony, by the way, every time I do teach it, the reason I'm able to do that is because of the, the, what draws me to law, what it is that makes law to me the most satisfying vocation that I can imagine. By, by that I mean calling, you know, when you have a call, when it's not just a job, it's a calling, right? What makes the law such a calling for me is one simple thing, language, right? What I saw in my dad's experience was all he had between him and rot in a prison cell was language, words, what, what he could do with the words, what words he was going to put together in a certain order, in a certain pattern, and if he put them together in the right order, guess what? The cell door opened. He found the key to the jailhouse door in the warden's own law books, in the words. I tell my students now that there are really four occupations in America whose bread and butter is word work, right? They live or die on the basis of the word work they do. Writers, poets, lawyers, and rappers, right? Those are the four. Those are four groups whose bread and butter is word work, right? And as Toni Morrison says, we die, in her Nobel laureate acceptance speech, we die, that may be the meaning of life but we do language. That may be the measure of our lives, right? It, as a lawyer, I appreciate the value of that insight uh, especially. And so have dedicated a lot of my life now to trying to make the frozen circumstances dance, these social injustices out here, make the frozen circumstances dance by playing them their own melody through the language, through the legal lexicon, the way my dad did. He was able to find a way to make the frozen circumstances he was confronting dance 
and change their configuration by singing to them the right melody, one that they, that they could move to and could sink in. And he knew which ones could because he understood language as well as he did. Let's talk about not just language, some other things that matter to me. Let's talk about other forms of symbolic communication because you have linguistic and non-linguistic forms of symbolic communication. One non-language, -lingu certainly, right, in word is language. That's a linguistic form of symbolic communication. My Twitter handle is nigga theory. The documentary about my work is nigga theory. The latest article I have out is titled nigga theory. Contingency, irony, and solidarity in the, substance of in the substance of criminal law, but it starts with nigga theory, right? Why do I use that epithet, that bloody, jagged edge epithet, soaked, blood soaked epithet, in my scholarly work on social justice and equity? What well, has to do, again, with my understanding of language, both linguistic and non-linguistic forms of symbolic communication, language, and how we can use them politically, how they can be political tools, weapons, and forces. So let me go to a non-linguistic form of symbolic communication to bring that home. My follicle fashion, i.e. my afro. Now, I used to have, in addition to the fro, a nice, like my man here, a nice beard. Right? Um, but... That's nothing new. I had a fro back in high school, right? I'm, when, I'm at, um, how many Lakers fans here? L.A. Lakers fans. Any L.A. Lakers fans? I'm from Lower Marion High School. That's where I went to high school, Kobe's High School. I had the scoring record there before he came, 22 a, a game in my senior year. He came and got 36 a game, so. <laughs> I hate to even bring it up, but, right? Um, Lower Marion is really where I rocked my first fro because I just wanted to add four inches to my height. In my defensive stand, so I went from 6'4 to 6'7'8. Right? That's why I was doing it back then. And to celebrate the African American soul because brothers and sisters were rocking fro's in the late 60s as an expression of political solidarity and hey, you know. I'm with you, you know, solid, we're one, right? That's why I did it back then. So I wasn't thinking about a fro at the time I sat down to write about three and a half years ago my article on the so-called New Jim Crow and why that way of looking at it is attractive as, that, as it is and, the, and as much as I've been talking about it that way for years and years has some problems associated with it. I was going to go deep into those problems and develop this theory that I call nigga theory. And so that meant I had to write this book on my sabbatical. And when I write, I don't know about y'all, but when I write, I, I need, I got to go into a zone and no air, food, water zone. Right? My, dad, my kids used to run around when I was writing. They'd always say, Dan Dryden, cemetery silence, cemetery silence. Because that, that was, you know, always cemetery, hey, you know, I can't hear a pin drop because I'm grinding, I'm thinking. Right? So I did that on my sabbatical for eight, nine months. You know, I have on sabbatical, eight, nine months. That meant in that eight or nine month period, I made no trips to the barbershop. Here are architects. It's my spot. I missed those trips. Just missed them. And so and then I came back from my sabbatical. I'm still kind of in grind mode, so I'm not thinking of that, you know, too much. I come in, okay, let me go teach my class. I get back and finish this book. I go in and start teaching my crim law class, I overhear students say it's ironic. That's the word they use. It's ironic that Professor Armour teaches criminal law while he looks like a criminal. Then I went downtown and uh, addressed some downtown attorneys about commercial transactions, which is really my, kind of my love. I came to law school to teach, you know, uniform commercial code. I wound up writing about criminal law and social justice, but that, if, you know, if we had a more equal society, I'd be doing criminal, I'd be doing commercial transactions now. I just love that stuff, right? So I'm down there talking to them about that a, 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 a week or two later. One of them calls back and reports to some of our people in our law building that Professor Armour's afro is, their words, impertinent and unprofessional, right? 
That's when I said, grow, baby, grow. No, right? That's when I said, grow, baby, grow. You know, we're going to get some magic grow. Let me get whatever can promote the, 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 the you know, growth of follicles. Let me go ahead and do that because, and you know the because here, right? The main because, I'm going to tell you the main because, and this ties into some issues and discussions we've been having around campus as part of inclusion, diversity, and equity. Because I am making a very unpopular form, I'm engaged in a very unpopular form of self-expression that some people find offensive or abrasive, sound familiar? Maybe triggered by, sound familiar? Um, but I have this thing called tenure. Whoa, tenure. Right, you talk about academic freedom. It is the bulwark. It is what keeps academic freedom meaningful. Right, the fact that I can rock this and say, you know, the only thing scarier to a lot of non-black folk than a black man with a gun is one with tenure. Right? It's just, it means never having to say you're sorry. Tenure means never having to say you're sorry for telling the truth. That's what it means. Right? So, before Kaepernick, now I'm, ro I'm rolling with Kaepernick, don't get, don't get me wrong. Kaepernick's got the right idea, but he started using non-linguistic symbolic communication in a political way to bond with a social movement to unify. You know, his fro is kind of a bat signal of solidarity with Black Lives Matter. Really, right, at the end of the day. And my fro is a bat signal of solidarity with brothers and sisters out here, you know, struggling with racial profiling. And lest you think that, you know, fashion is fun, oh yeah, it must be kind of fun to be a prof and out here, you know, just being whoever you, yourself, you know, whoever you want to be. And, you know, that's fun. No, it's not just fun and game. What we're talking about in Black Lives Matter is that these forms of expression are costly, can be very costly. Freedom of expression is not free. It can be extremely costly. It can be high finance. Free expression can be high finance, i.e., I'm down here at JW Marriott. A while ago now, met my roommate, Lino Garcia, who is, uh, was my ABC roommate, a better chance. Better chance takes kids out of inner city areas, right, and puts them in good high schools where they have a better chance to go to college, upward bound, a better chance. So I'm a product of a better chance, a great society program at the time. So I met Lino Garcia, my roommate from A Better Chance, down here at JW Marriott. He was the uh, general manager of ESPN Deportes. So I hadn't seen him for a while. We hadn't seen each other for a while. So we got together, you know, drank a toast to innocence, drank a toast to time, all that stuff you do when you haven't seen people for a long time get back together. And when we were done, I'm waiting, to, for, my, I'm waiting for my Uber ride in the lobby of J.W. Marriott and three guards approach me. Two white and a black. They send the black guy over. Right? Two white ones stand back. And I was dressed like I am now without the tie. So you get the picture. This is the whole picture. Like I am now without the tie. The guard comes over. He says, uh, sir, are you here to see someone? I said, well, yes, I am, but why aren't you asking anyone else in the lobby? He said, well, sir, we've been having a problem with transients. Right? You know, Skid Row is right down there, right there. We've been having a problem with transients. Now, as a lawyer, I know exactly what he's saying there, but I wanted to hear him say, I, wanted to, I didn't want it to be implied, even if it's how, however clear the implication. I wanted to hear him say it. So I said, you're saying, so you're saying I look like a transient? He says, sir, don't take it personally, right? And walks away to join the other two. At that point, the nice thing about teaching for 20 years at SC is a lot of your students are out working now in the law firm. So I call one of my students at Latham Watkins. 
And I said, if he comes back, I want you to be on the phone. Plus, I started tweeting. <laughs> you know, I had belt and suspenders going, you know, approach to this. And he came back. No, I, and, I, you know, I, I did this just in case, but I thought it was remote possibility. He came back. And he said to me, sir, what is the name of the guest you're here to see? Now, as a tort professor and as a criminal law professor, I can characterize that transaction for you legally. Legally, what he was saying was, if I don't give them a name that they can find in their database of guests, I've assumed the ejectable status of a trespasser. And they were getting ready to lay hands on me and throw me out of that lobby. That's what that was all about. So we're real clear, right? And that, that left me with a decision that black men have to make every day. And I've had to make more times than I want to admit. And here's the, here was the choice set. It was very straightforward. Either I give him the name, Lino Garcia, and they go and find it in the database. And in doing so, I vindicate his perception of me as a homeless person, right? I swallow that indignity. I suffer that microaggression. I experience that spirit murder that comes along with that. Either I do that or, number two, and this is the only other choice, I tell him to go fuck himself. Right? That, those are only two. That's your choice set. If I tell him that, you know, regardless of what you've seen on TV, we all know and one doesn't do too well against three. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> no, no, in real life it doesn't happen, right? So I know with, with that option, I know that the outcome is going to be I'm going to be in the back of a, of a wagon, police cruiser, right? I'm going to be heading down to the station, cuffed, and there's going to be some news reports, you know, for my students about a USC criminal law professor arrested for assault. Details at 6 and 11. That's the other choice. Those are the two. There's no other. Right? Um, and I regret to this day, I'm going to be honest, you know, it was a couple years ago, there's not a night that goes by that I don't regret giving him that name and swallowing that indignity and suffering that Sandra Bland kind of spirit murder. Right? But that's just, that's, you know, a day in the life of a black man or woman in America, right? Um, and, and a lot of other people from maligned and marginalized groups uh, for that matter. So how have I tried to take on some of these issues? Uh, you know, what matters to me is not just analyzing the problem, not just cursing the gloom, but lighting a candle. Right. So what have I tried to, what, you know, what are some of the solutions? What are some of the ways out of this problem? Well, one of the big things that I've concluded over time and looking at this problem uh, for now quite a few years is that one of the big problems is there's an in empathy deficit that not, I'm going to start with black folk, right? Uh, this, this analysis can apply to lots of marginalized groups. If you're from a stereotype group, the same analysis applies. That's why they had me over in Poland talking about stereotypes and prejudice over there, even though I'm writing about black American race relations, because stereotypes and prejudice at a formal level are structurally very similar. Right? They're structured all systems approaches to those kinds of phenomena. So what are some of the possible solutions when it comes to for example, let's focus on the plight of black folk in particular for a moment, because if you go down to Skid Row, what I was just talking about, 75% of it is black people. You know, those same 75% of almost all of them black men, less than 3 4% of state population is black male. Going to prisons, you'll see the same disproportionality. Demographically, the two most miserable places in our country the two most miserable places in the prison cells and on Skid Row are, dis are dominated by black people, black bodies. No doubt about it. The faces at the bottom of the well are black. Contrary to all of the alt-right white nationalist stuff that, got, that sw helped sweep Trump into office, those are just the reality. You go look at the numbers. Men lie, women lie, numbers don't. 
right? That's the empirical reality. So what to, what, why is that? What, why are those faces continuously, recurrently, uh, the faces at the bottom of the well? I'm saying it's because of empathy deficit problems. I'm saying I think a lot of it's unconscious. My analyses have been focusing on the cognitive unconscious and how that drives our responses to socially marginalized groups. And I think when it comes to black folk, you can explain a lot of, not all, but a lot of what's been happening to the black community on the basis of empathy deficits, a lack of care and concern for their well-being, those others. Right? Let me give you an example of where you saw that empathy, de empathy deficit. Hurricane Katrina. Hurricane Katrina in 2005, I think it's 2005 6. 2005 or 6, Hurricane Katrina hits the Ninth Ward and other parts of New Orleans. You had the people standing on rooftops, black bodies on the Ninth Ward with water up to their belly, help, screaming out for help. Four days in, you had Sean Penn rowing up there with fresh water because FEMA still couldn't get its act together to get in to help those black folk in the Ninth Ward, right? Go back and check out Katrina. You'll see that all over. That's Katrina. That was the response to Katrina, the tardy, del delinquent response to Katrina, right? Compare that to the response to 9-11. There was a panic of empathy for those victims, and you just got it done. Nobody let any bureaucratic red tape get in the way of anything. There was a panic of empathy, right? There wasn't the same panic of empathy for those black bodies in the Ninth Ward when those pictures were being streamed back, right? And you saw a difference in response. Why, this, why the lack of the same panic of empathy? Well, this, the studies that I just finished doing and included in my last book, I think, go a long way to explain because I did a lot of work about unconscious bias in my earlier work. Now, but when I was doing this earlier stuff, they didn't have brain imaging. Now they have, you can do the brain imaging studies, right? And you can see what parts of the brain are firing or not when they're perceiving or judging, going through different exercises. And what they found is that when a person is watching another person, for example, drink a cup of water, as you're looking at that person as the observer, in your brain, your mirror neurons are firing and you're simulating what you see. You simulate what you see, and you don't actually do what you're seeing, but you simulate it in your brain, right? It's what makes it possible for you to look up at a movie sc screen and, you know, cringe when something comes. You're, you're identifying with, you're projecting, you're simulating, you're there, right? They're, so they call these mirror neurons. They help you simulate. So you, you would imagine yourself in your mind, you're drinking the, the water just like the person you're watching is drinking the water, right? That, that's a mirror neuron. Here's what they found. So these mirror neurons are the basic building blocks of empathy, right? If you can identify with someone to that extent, if you can simulate, if you can resonate with them on that level, then you can start to empathize. It's the basic building blocks of empathy is mirror neurons, okay? What they found, though, is that, and then I'm going to take questions, that when a person is looking at a member of an out group, that doesn't belong in their, that's not one of their in-group, and they're looking at an out-group member, their mirror neurons don't fire. And you can go, the, uh, Google under in-group empathy bias, in-group love, and series of studies, right? This is all happening at an unconscious level. So it's not that people aren't empathizing, that they're indifferent because they don't care consciously. They don't care on an unconscious level. They just don't feel the pain of these out-group members, like they do in-group members, right? And without that empathy, how are you going to count the cost of their suffering in your social policy making? You're not, right? But it's happening at an unconscious level. It's not, you know, the Ku Klux Klan variety of prejudice that was popular once when people went around intentionally discriminated. Right? It is people are unconsciously indifferent. The new form of, of discrimination that's dominant in 2017 that distinguishes from 50 years ago is this unconscious indifference about the pain and plight of people I don't em empathize with at an unconscious level. Right? So I'm going to kind of stop there for now so that I can start to take some questions. But I want to give you a quick background on the kind of research I've been doing and what kind of brought me to doing this kind of research. And we can get into more of that because I'm kind of going in a, 
in a lot of different directions with this research, as you might imagine. But I'd like to, with Varun, take some questions. And I think we have a mic back there. Don't be shy. I'm a law professor. You know I can call on folk. <laughs> Do a little Socratic method. Hi, <laughs> thank you for coming out today. I'm a student at the Roski Art Department. My name is Benicia. Uh, my question is, um, I don't remember exactly what you said, but uh, you were saying how some groups were marginalized, like within their own group. So how do you overcome that? Yeah, nice question. Lateral denigration, the marginalization of people within their own marginalized group. We heap double marginalization on our, some of our own sometimes by going after people who share our social identity, who share our plight, but we dump on them. Lateral denigration. They call that lateral denigration. Right? And here, let me give you an example of lateral denigration in its full uh, fury, vicious fury. Chris Rock, one of his most famous routines, the reason I call my work nigga theory. Let's get down to it. Chris Rock in one of his most, the, the routine that launched his career. Now people are putting microphones in front of his mouth. Chris Rock, talk to us about racial justice like he's an expert. Okay, here's how he, lost his, here's how he launched his career. He went back and forth in front of a black audience. Uh, the, every, I, when I, it used to be just about every black household I went in had this, this video. Um, he went back and forth in front of a black audience saying, let me see if I can remember the routine. It's something like, it's like a civil war going on in black America. And there's two sides. There's black people and there's niggas. And niggas have got to go. I love black people, but I hate niggas. Boy, I wish they'd let me join the Ku Klux Klan. Shit, I'd do a drive-by from here to Brooklyn. Right? That's how he starts, and he keeps going like that for 45 minutes, right? He goes to watch the routine. What's his core definition of a nigga? A black criminal, a black person who's done crime. That's his core definition, right? So you talk about lateral denigration. What he's talking about is in some of our neighborhoods, sadly, and I put this in an article recently, and they said, this sounds so like such a big number, Professor. We're going to need a pinpoint site. Are you sure you can back it? We pinpoint sighted it. Up to 90% of young black males in some of these inner city neighborhoods are going to wind up in jail on probation or on parole at some point in their lives. You're telling me that up to 90% of our community are niggas? You, you're, you've come up with a definition of lovable black people and condemnable niggas that r condemns 90% of your kids to niggadom? Right? No, but that's Chris Rock. That's Randy Kennedy of Harvard Law School draws the same distinction in the more genteel language of the legal academy. He says black community, need, black community needs to distinguish between good Negroes and bad Negroes. Bill Cosby, the pound cake speech. Well, at the 2004 NAACP Image Awards, he's getting the pound cake speech. Uh, he gives the pound cake speech as he's getting. He says, people are complaining about that black boy getting shot in the head over the pound cake. Well, why did he steal the pound cake? Sounding chilling like Michael Brown. Why do you steal the pound cake? I've been hungry. I've looked in and seen pound cake and not taken it. You know why? Something called upbringing, right? There's that kind of sanctimonious finger wagging, politics of respectability, lateral denigration to large sections of your whole community. That Dr. Huxtable, the icon of black Brahminness, right? Black Brahmin par excellence, the black bourgeoisie representative par excellence, right? Um, he comes in and they, I, I, I can point out some Obama examples. I can go up and down the list of, of, of black folk who laterally denigrate other black folk on these kinds of grounds, right? And especially ones like Cosby are going around, like so many of them, sanctimoniously lecturing while he's slipping roofies in women's drinks and raping them, right? There's a, there's a point at which the evidence gets pretty compelling. Right? But that's the kind of first degree hypocrisy that you see of so many in this lateral denigration game. That's real popular because it gets you a lot of kudos from the establishment and those who are in power. They love it, you know, um, um, Ben Carson, et cetera, Clarence Thomas. 
I'm going I'm going to name check. You know, we got to we we got to have we got to have some conversation. So, what do you do about that? My my uh, I have a whole uh, my quick answer to that and then I'll take some more questions. My quick answer to that is you have to realize those folks who try to play that game, they have to realize that it's an exercise in futility. Right? You think that what you're, what you're trying to say very often is don't confuse me with them. I'm a good Negro. Don't confuse me with the bad Negroes. Right? That's the move you want to make. Up in my own neighborhood in View Park, the L.A. Times recently called the Black Beverly Hills. You take View Park, Baldwin Hills, v Windsor Hills, and Ladera Heights, put them all together. You have the largest upper middle class neighborhood in the country of blacks, black neighborhood in the country. You have my own neighbors when I've had folks over from other neighborhoods and schools. I've had my own neighbors come to me and say, we don't want Compton up here. I've had a sheriff's deputy tell my event planner, we don't want South Central up here, even though we live in South Central. <laughs> but it's up the hill. Oh, wait a minute, no. Why don't you change a few degrees up the hill? We don't want them up here, right? That's the kind of lateral denigration we're talking about because that what appears to be a moral distinction between good and bad Negroes is really a class distinction parading, masquerading as a moral distinction because the crime rate between middle class blacks and middle class whites is roughly the same. So most of those so-called bad Negroes, most of those who are involved in crime are from truly disadvantaged blacks. So Rock could have said just as accurately, I love middle class blacks, but I hate poor blacks. And he would have been just about as accurate because it's a class distinction masquerading as a moral distinction, hiding class bigotry. So I'm sorry, I, I, I can go on, but I, I'll, I'll leave that for that. I think we have a hand down here. So I'm really fascinated by your, your research and would like to know more. But right now, I'm, I'm grappling with all that you've shared. And what's on the tip of my mind is, what is the antidote to the uh, racial, the unconscious bias that we all yes. have lurking around somewhere in our minds and that we face out there in the exterior environment? Great question. There, uh, uh, once you see stereotypes as well-learned sets of associations that can run automatically without our conscious awareness, that's the nature of a stereotype. My first article, the one in Cal Law Review, one of my first articles, that was at the time, that was n you know, relatively new research where I'm applying empirical psychology to the decision making of jurors and other folks. And what, we, what, what you come up with is you start thinking of stereotypes as well learned, not as actual beliefs people have, but as well learned sets of associations that can run automatically without our conscious awareness. So for example, the three-year-old little white girl who Phyllis Katz in the New York Times described as when she saw a black infant in New York, she says to her mom, the three-year-old white girl, right? Look, mom, a baby made, right? Now that three-year-old little girl isn't a bigot. She isn't a racist. She's simply describing an association that's been forged in her memory between people from a certain social group and an occupation she routinely sees them in, right? That's a well-learned association for her. She may reach the age of judgment, 18 or what have you, and come to renounce that as an appropriate way to respond to women from that category, right? She may say, I shouldn't think of them as maids. That is at odds with my personal standards for how I ought to respond to the world. But that doesn't mean the stereotype has gone away. That well-learned set of associations disappeared, right? The question is, which information structure, the stereotype, well-learned stereotype, or the personal standards is going to control your perceptions and judgments when it comes to looking at people from that group? And my answer is, once you see that a stereotype is like a mental habit, a well-learned set of associations that can run automatically without your conscious awareness, how do you confront a habit? When you want to break a habit, how do you approach breaking a habit, a bad habit? Let's say you have a bad habit. One thing you don't do is ignore it. The last thing, when you're ever you're in the, in the presence of environmental cues that trigger the habitual responses, what you do is you call to mind your new standards, your new personal commitments and convictions for how you're going to respond. And then you consciously inhibit your, your, your habitual responses and replace them with the ones you identify with, right? Let's say I bite my nails every time I wind up in front of the TV. When I wind up in front of the TV, I got to say, oh, wait a minute. In front of the TV, let me, 
not fall into the nail-biting habit, I'll start to, in other words, fighting habits, mental habits, takes intention, attention, and effort, right? When you're in the presence of environmental cues that trigger that. In other words, color consciousness, not color blindness. Notice how this flies in the face of the panaceas and solutions we've had for discrimination. Oh, be blind to race, be blind to gender, be blind to LGBTQ status, right? Well, that ostrich head in the sand approach to race, yeah, to that, discrim to, to that discriminatory factor may actually allow unconscious bias to thrive. It may allow the, the, the mental habit to run unchecked. Right? You need color consciousness, in, you know, intention, attention, like Clarence Darrow did when he was brought out of retirement to represent this black doctor, Ocean Sweet, who moved into a white neighborhood in Detroit in the 1920s and was greeted by a home improvement association who was trying to get rid of him. Right? And so 300 people, then 500 people. The second night, he shot over their crowd when, uh, when, they, when they lurched toward the, the house and killed somebody, and he and everyone in the house were tried for murder. Clarence Darrow was brought out of retirement to represent him. There was a black man in the heyday of, the, of Jim Crow with an all-white male jury arguing for his life. And what did Clarence Darrow do? He said, he didn't take the color blindness approach. He was color, con he said, consider, gentlemen of the jury, what you would do if you had black skin, if you went through, right now, he said, for, he, he used to have these two-day closing arguments. Right now, he said, if you went out in the street right now and you had your choice between having a trolley car cut off your leg or get black skin, which would you choose? And he knew the answer was cut off the leg. That's why he said it, right? He got into it in that way, consciously confront your bias against this person. Go back to Trayvon Martin, for example, right? George Zimmerman, right? Consciously confront the racial factor. Engage in racial role reversals. Make Trayvon Martin a 17-year-old Brad Pitt. And make George Zimmerman Wesley Snipes. And ask yourself if you're going to get the same result from that jury. No. You're not going to get the same result from that jury. Right? They're going to empathize a lot more with the victim and a lot less with the victimizer, which is how which drives those decisions in the first place, those outcomes in the first place. Right? So color consciousness is at the end of the day, what I'm saying is one of the solutions, one of the interventions is resisting the advice we've had for a hundred years to be color blind and instead be conscious, consciously confront the fact that we are subject to unconscious bias against members of, of stereotype groups and do as much as we can to combat succumbing to those habits. So that's just one move. And then there are lots of other moves. That, that, that's just kind of one at the psychological level. Then we have to get at some of the other uh, levels too, how it is that we divide, distinguish between good and bad people as a general matter and consider these bad people wicked and so much human toxic waste to be dumped somewhere. So we can get into that too. Okay, the wrap up. That is, that's the wrap. That's the wrap part. So I'll just say in closing, 19, whoa, 2017 is, we're getting ready to look, uh, look at, in a, a, at a, a change, a transition in leadership. And we have someone who came into office on a platform that seemed to be the opposite of inclusion, diversity, and equity. It seemed to be like you had one side over here, inclusion, diversity, and equity folk. And you have the other folk over here, the anti-inclusion, diversion, and equity folk. At least, you know, this is one interpretation, racial resentment factors and other things. Um, and, and at the end of the day, the folks who were not bothered, I'm not saying they voted for um, Trump because he, of his racist thing, but they weren't deal breakers. It wasn't a deal breaker that he was an avowedly virulent misogynist. It wasn't a deal breaker that he was talking about rounding up Muslims and, a, and, and or at least putting them on a watch list, you know, which leads then to Korematsu. Uh, so I think it's an opportunity for us, and this will be my closing remarks, it's an opportunity for us in this university setting to say it, that this is one 
area in which con con inclusion, diversity, and equity matter. We're going to wrap our arms around those values. Just like Martin Luther King, speaking of MLK, and I'm going to turn this over to you, Varun. When MLK was doing his thing, they, did a st they had some polls recently that I saw out come out a couple days ago. Only 20 to 25 percent of the American people were supporting what they were doing thinking that any of that marching was making a positive difference, 20 to 25. So, you, you know, you don't, you don't get to moral truths through nose counting. You get through, you know, we've made a commitment as an institution, inclusion, diversity, and equity. You know, that's just what we're going to try to live by and put our stakes on, even if it's not the popular morality right now of the moment. And, uh, and that's, the, that's a positive thing. So I'm glad that I, we, could, we could start this conversation. Let's hear it for Jody David Armour. I told you he was a prophetic voice, a critical voice in this time. Jody, on behalf of the student committee, I want to present you with this journal so you can continue to grind and reflect upon what matters to you and why. One more time, please, let's hear it for our friend and colleague, <laughs> Professor Armour. Please join us for our next sessions uh, in the months to come. Please take care of yourself and fight on. <laughs>